Uh, G'day everyone um, and uh, a very warm welcome. My name is Robin Mellon. I'm the CEO of Better Sydney and I'll be leading us through this webinar on prioritizing your modern slavery risks. As we start today's event, I'd like to acknowledge the Bidjigal and Gadigal people who traditionally lived along the Sydney coast where I am now, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands wherever you're joining this webinar from across all states and territories and, and indeed internationally. So welcome to everyone who's joined us today to be part of this conversation. I'm, I'm very glad you could make it. And a warm hello to everyone listening to the recording after the event, uh, as we are uh, indeed recording this webinar for future access. It's also important to recognize uh, here at the start the, the more than 40 million people around the world in conditions of modern slavery, the issue at the very heart of today's conversation. In a moment, I'll introduce the, uh, the experts contributing to this webinar, and we'll hear just a couple of minutes from each of them about what they're seeing and hearing on this topic, especially given their areas of, of expertise, their sectors and industries, and I've asked them to provide, provide a brief uh, past, uh, present and future focus. I'll then lead a bit of a discussion by posing a few questions, drawing out some of the issues that uh, we've heard uh, and asking um, each of the speakers just to outline uh, a few more um, things around their, their expertise, their, their networks and the work that their organizations are doing. And then we'll be going to, to you, the audience, for your questions. So please, as we go, you don't have to wait till the end, please write your questions in the chat box as we go. And we'll try to answer as many as we can in the time provided. I may squeeze some in as we go if they're particularly on topic. Uh, otherwise, we have space at the end to answer. So this is your, your chance to ask questions of the experts here. So um, it's a good rule. If you're wondering about an issue, it's likely that someone else is as well. Um, please try to keep your questions reasonably brief. Um, no essays in the chat box, please, um, so we can get through them all. And we'll be wrapping up uh, just before 10.30 a.m. So I do hope you can stay and discover more about prioritizing your human rights and modern slavery risks with us. During the webinar, um, you are all requested to keep your microphones on mute uh, so that we've got the best audio quality possible. Uh, and the speakers will be talking without slides. Uh, an audio recording of the event will be made available afterwards um, on different websites, including the Supply Chain Sustainability School. And lastly, if, if you haven't already, we'd be grateful if you could let us know where you're joining us from, uh, maybe just a, a name and city or name and country, uh, just so we can find out a bit more about our audience. So please just write the information in the chat box as we go. As I mentioned, uh, my name is Robin Mellon. I have multiple roles, but for this webinar, I'm the, the CEO of Better Sydney and the project manager for the Property Council of Australia's Modern Slavery Working Group and Supplier Platform. With me, I am fortunate enough to have some of my favorite people working in this space. Um, delighted uh, to welcome Nicole Thompson, uh, the Head of Sustainable and Ethical Procurement at Edge Environment. Uh, we have Susan Mizrahi, the Chief Sustainability Officer at Australia Post. We have Justin Dillon, the CEO and founder of Freedom and Made in a Free World. And Nicole D'Souza, who is the Ethical Sourcing Manager at Conoco Minolta Australia. You can read uh, a bit more about each of today's experts on their LinkedIn pages, uh, which are linked, hyperlinked from the Humanities event page. And a very big thank you uh, to all of the panelists and the audience uh, for giving up your time today. <clears throat> I'm really looking forward to the conversation and, of course, the questions. So I guess to dive into the topic and give it a little bit of context, the, the guidelines for reporting entities which uh, accompany the Modern Slavery Act state very clearly, and I quote, the risks of modern slavery practices means the potential for your entity to cause, contribute to, or be directly linked to modern slavery through its operations and supply chains. In other words, the risks that your entity may be involved in modern slavery. And, and it's, it's vital to remember the next part. The concept of risk in this context means risk to people rather than risk to your entity, such as financial or, or rep reputational damage. However, often these risks to people will intersect with risks to your entity. 
Now, uh, many of you will be familiar with those words, but they're, they're useful to frame what we're going to talk about. I think most uh, organizations of, of, of any size are familiar with risk assessment and with risk management, or they'll discuss a, a risk matrix at, at regular intervals. But here is a risk that is in many ways new uh, to many organizations, the risk of harm to people. And with uh, an economic downturn with a global pandemic, with, with numerous sustainability concerns, it may seem difficult to prioritize. So let's hear from each of today's speakers about what they're hearing and seeing in, in the, the human rights and the modern slavery space at the moment, and particularly about some of the risks across uh, environmental, economic, and social areas. I've asked each person, as I said, to start with just a couple of minutes to give you a snapshot of, of past, present, and future work. So I might turn to uh, Nicole Thompson uh, uh, to start us off. Nicole, tell us what you're, you're seeing. Uh, thanks, Roman. So looking into the past, I think just start off with um, what Edge Environment does as a business or a sustainability consultancy. And really the, the core of our business is to help other organisations understand their risk. And so part of our expertise is around life cycle assessment and really looking at that cradle to grave, probably heard that before, um, and throughout the supply chain. So that's really, I guess, looking to the past, how we've come to be working in modern slavery today, because we use that same life cycle methodology to help organisations under their, understand their risk. So coupled with the other area we work with, which is sustainability strategy and sustainable procurement. So using those you know, strategic targets, goals, what's of value to a business, and then how that is then enacted through their governance, risk management, procurement systems, is how they then um, go to manage those risks. So if I look at the work that we're doing with clients today in the present, and we really work with a big cross-section of clientele, so that's from property to fashion and food. Um, we're in aged care, you know, um, education products, and we're seeing that everybody, everybody's definitely at a different stage at the moment, which I think is reassuring to a lot of people sometimes to hear um, that no one's quite got this figured out yet. So. At the moment, we're working with clients in a bit of a mix. We're helping them understand their risk, those who are still in the early days, and more so in doing that prioritisation process. So where can we have you know, the biggest impact? And then coupling that again with that procurement process. And so we work a lot in ISO 2400 sustainable procurement and use that as a guideline to help prioritise, okay, where can we have the biggest impact as we as we roll out our mitigation um, of the risk. Uh, I might quickly touch on the, when we go back to like 2017, when we first started out in this, the Responsible Construction Leadership Group asked us to do a bit of a research study around the property sector's um, readiness for modern slavery act. In a nutshell, the readiness, they weren't ready. Um, and one of the key recommendations out of that was around partnerships. And so fast forward to today, I think the Property Council of Australia, one of the one of our clients, their working group on modern slavery um, and the supplier platform that they created, you know, this was an awesome demonstration of that partnership. So starting from basically nothing and, and moving to this platform that's now out there. So um, I guess in terms of future, we'd like to see more of that, more of partnerships. And I think in the next couple of years, we'll really start to see more and more organisations get stuck into that due diligence aspect of risk mitigation. Um, and I think, yeah, the best practice we're seeing is really either partnerships or where you're looking at procurement and strategy of a business holistically and how human rights fits into that and becomes a core value rather than a bit of a, a tack on, this is a new issue that we need to address. So yeah, hope to see more of that in the future. Thanks, Nicole. Um, that's that's great. I'm, I'll, I've said it before and I'll say it again, partnership is the new leadership. So it's good to hear that in your future focus as well. Um, let's turn um, to uh, Susan Mizrahi. I'd, I'd be delighted to hear your, your past, present and future views. 
Sure. Um, thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to join you all today. Um, I might just start with a little bit about myself. So I um, got into the field of corporate social responsibility or sustainability uh, through a background in human rights and um, was, first of all, lobbying overseas around the China-Tibet issue. Um, long before all the attention was on focused on Xinjiang, there was a, a lot more focus on uh, China with respect to Tibet. And um, I found uh, myself lobbying countries about their China policy and increasingly became concerned about um, human rights issues being perpetrated by com uh, companies, not just countries. And so I thought that I wanted to transition my career into the field of corporate social responsibility. And I came back to Australia about 12 years ago and led World Vision in Australia's campaign on this topic of human trafficking and child labour. It was when I first crossed paths with Justin. He was promoting his film at that time and um, we were trying to um, increase public understanding of this issue before the establishment of the Walk Free. Um, and so I found, uh, yeah, I focused on it for about four years uh, fast forward, I, I, I moved uh, into the field of corporate social responsibility and um, and uh, picked up a role at Australia Post uh, about five years ago now. So from an Australia Post perspective, um, every household name, but not necessarily, necessarily everybody understands the business from a sustainability lens. Um, so, you know, we're a government business enterprise. Our shareholder is the Australian government, so the government of the day. Um, and we are legislated to turn both a profit and to provide a community service. And that attracts a workforce that is very concerned about social issues and wants to give back to the community. Um, in 2014, before I joined, uh, before I joined Australia Post, uh, one of our customers raised concerns about a, a, a product that prompted the business to look more carefully at its supply chain and, and into its uh, supplier code of conduct and revisited that at that time. Um, then when I came on board, we uh, have since set up a group corporate responsibility plans um, and uh, we've had two strategies, but the second one that we launched a year ago very much focused um, or, or had an emphasis on modern slavery and, and a commitment to uh, achieve greater supply chain transparency and traceability as well. So we've been doing a lot of work in the past um, three years on this topic, um, knowing that the legislation was on the horizon and then since it's come into effect. Um, we issued a, a, internally, we released a draft statement 12 months ago to give a level of comfort to the board and to senior management about what this issue was and how we're going to have to uh, publicly report in future years. Um, and we've literally now just uh, finished our, our 2020 modern slavery statement. It goes to the board tomorrow, so fingers crossed, it just uh, gets signed off because it has been a lot of work. Um, so moving forward, uh, we, we're really going to be delivering on some of the, the commitments and um, the aspects that we outline in that statement and hope to get a greater supply chain transparency beyond tier one because um, at this stage we, have a, we don't have a consistent approach across the board. Thanks, Susan. That's great. And it's actually really good to hear that uh, that framing of sort of corporate social responsibility and social sustainability and human rights within that. Um, and yes, fingers crossed for uh, the, the statement going through the board. Thank you. Um, Justin, let's uh, let's turn to you. Uh, you're joining us today from California, so I guess you get to see, uh, you know, more of a, I guess, an international perspective, but I guess an objective view of what's going on in Australia. Tell us your past, present, and future focus. Well, first of all, Robin, thanks for having me. You're a fantastic host, by the way. Let's be all be honest. We've done a lot of webinars. You're fantastic. You keep the energy going. I appreciate you having me. Let me do this. Um, I do feel like I'm connected to Australia just about every day. We have a lot of customers there. We've got a managing director there, a lot of friends there. So I do feel like it's a it's a it's a it's another home for me. Um, I've been working on this issue of forced labor for over 12 years. Uh, I, I got started by, as, as Susan mentioned, um, I stepped into it uh, make, making a film that went around the world uh, that to help people become uh, aware of it. Uh, that film led to some digital campaigns and some platforms that we created to create activism. That was my step into te technology. Um, some of that technology got recognized by the Obama administration, and they asked me to help create some technology with them to help consumers understand 
um, more about forced labor. So this is in 2011, 2012. Uh, we created a website called Slavery Footprint, which can tell you how many slaves it takes to run your life. So brand agnostic, uh, but very much connected to big data, algorithms, consumption, and essentially the very end of a supply chain, the very uh, the, the end point of where a supply chain lives. We expected, uh, first of all, who's going to go to a website called Slavery Footprint? That sounds like the world's largest bummer calculator. And uh, we did. We had a, a very, uh, you know, we expected maybe 150,000 people would, would use the website in a year. Uh, we, we reached that goal in, a, in an hour. And, and over 50 million people around the world know the answer to that question, how many slaves work for them. Anyone on this webinar can go learn that answer as well. It's not something you share at cocktail parties, if you remember what those are. But um, it was the beginning of what I believe was, for me, very much a movement. So when Slavery Footprint came out, I found myself talking at a lot of business conferences about supply chains. And at the same time, while we were pushing that, I was also doing programs where working directly, uh, rescuing kids in slavery. And I remember one particular rescue we did, I met a little boy out on a lake in Ghana named Ebenezer. And when I met his captor, I asked his captor, why, why is Ebenezer out here fishing all night? And he's seven years old, he should be in school. And the man said, you know, very, very clearly, if he doesn't work, I don't eat. And so I was in this position where I was seeing, okay, <laughs> I can see it for myself. I can fly there, drive there and see it. And I can see on the other side of the supply chain, the people who want cleaner supply chains, but no one knows on these two ends where supply chain is. And that's when I decided to connect these dots is really going to create need to be a network. And I've been working on that for eight years. And Freedom, the company that I founded, is a supply chain analysis tool. Um, it's an app that companies use to be able to understand, mitigate risk, specifically for forced labor in their supply chains. And we built this right around the times that the laws were coming out, having no expectation that there'd be conversations like this happening around the world. Um, it's so incredible to see what people are doing with this movement. But for us right now, it's really about getting people on the platform, getting an understanding of their risk, using big data and analytics. What we're seeing in the future is there's gonna be a network effect and we're already seeing it. And as technologists, you're always looking for behavior. You're looking for signals in the, big, in the data going, where are people looking? What are the questions being asked? And what we're seeing is companies, just like Susan was saying, companies wanna know what the connections are. What are the sub tier risk? Because to your point, this is a risk against people. And if you don't can't figure out the commercial relationships connected to them, it's going to be hard to make an impact. So that's really where we're going as a company. Thanks, Justin. It's, it's really good to hear you draw in those elements of, of behavior and uh, data and technology. I think we'll come back to those a bit later on because they form a, a really important bridge with the, you know, the partnerships uh, that Nicole and Susan were mentioning. So I think we need to get into that in, in a bit more detail to, to work out how we manage these risks. Nicole D'Souza, turning to you, tell us a bit more about your, your past, present and future focus. Sure. Um, thanks so much, Robin, and thank you for the invitation. It's a real honour. I'm very humbled after hearing all those personal stories um, to be sharing the podium with um, with Justin and uh, Nicole and Susan and yourself. Um, so I'll, a little bit about me, just to, um, to sort of help understand my perspective. Um, I'm a human rights lawyer by background and regulatory lawyer and have worked um, uh, as a trade union lawyer in the cleaning industry, um, representing workers um, in, in wage claims and, and other such matters. Um, internationally, um, briefly representing the Australian government at the Human Rights Council at the UN um, and in international human rights advocacy um, and many years as a regulatory lawyer. So good governance and, and um, codes of conduct are sort of my, my lifeblood. Um, and I think I bring all of those things together in trying to operationalize um, what we call human rights due diligence at Conica Minolta. Um, so I work for the Australian subsidiary of a global um, multinational company, Conica Minolta Inc., which is a manufacturer of um, print devices, office technology, and other health equipment. Here in Australia, um, Conica Minolta Business Solutions Australia is the distributor of our parent company manufactured product, as well as third-party products such as robotic 
um, process automation, 3D printing, um, and software solutions and enterprise content management. So it's quite a broad um, area of B2B support that we provide. Uh, and our customers in Australia are everything from government to not-for-profit organisations, schools, um, small businesses, local government um, councils, um, and very large corporate and enterprise um, customers as well. Um, so Conica Minolta in Australia, uh, as I said, our global parent company um, uh, is, is a, a different entity, but they started on this responsible sourcing journey um, some years ago and have a fairly um, well-established responsible sourcing program partnered with the Responsible Business Alliance. And um, back in 2015, Conica Minolta in Australia, then led by Dr. David Cook as our managing director, um, went on a journey, I think, of awareness which led to the establishment of the local ethical sourcing program, which I'm now the um, incumbent position lead on. And really that came about from a little bit like Justin's story, connecting the dots between the suffering of people that we don't see and have no direct exposure to, and a moment of awakening where the people who you know sell print technology in our business said, wow, we, we'll never forget what we've seen and or heard and what can we do and how does this relate to our, our own operations? And so what had happened there, I won't tell the whole story in detail, but what had happened there is, you know, as an organisation that goes on multiple conferences, um, previously they involved planes and trips to interesting places in the world. Um, one of those trips was in Thailand and it was there that my colleagues came into um, contact with stories about the horrors of slavery in the Thai fishing industry. Uh, they were actually on a boat at the time and heard about vessels in the surrounding waters that had slaves on them and people being sold um, for, for um, cash dollar amounts. And that was a really shocking realisation that a human being in this day and age, uh, you know, this is five years ago that this occurred, um, that human beings in this day and age are still being bought and sold and um, are not free to leave and are, uh, can be bound to um, do something at somebody else's bidding. And um, so... Fast forward to where we are now, Conica Minolta launched its ethical sourcing roadmap and decided to make that open source to really invite other businesses to go on the same journey of asking themselves how human rights might be um, negatively impacted in their own direct operations and supply chains. And like most businesses that are scratching their heads now, Conica Minolta also was asking those questions and continues to ask those questions about what do we do now that we know about this problem, what's the solution? So we very quickly realised that collaboration was at the heart of action and we became a, an advocate, our business became an advocate for action to address modern slavery um, and joined in a coalition with other businesses, civil society organisations, a very broad cross-section calling for a level playing field to be introduced in Australia, which eventually led to the introduction of the Modern Slavery Act. Konica Minolta is now a reporting entity under that act and as a Japanese um, parent company, we have a Japanese financial year. And so we have just submitted on the 30th of September our first modern slavery statement um, as a reporting entity under that act. Um, so it, that, that document will be available um, publicly very shortly. And so I invite everyone to you know feel free to, to review that statement. And it's an ongoing journey. Um, we certainly do not have all of the answers. We have not solved all of the problems. And I think it's really important to realise that as you go on a journey of awareness and action, you can only continue to be aware of what you must do next and you must continue to move forward with that. So currently we are developing our new CSR strategy. Um, our current CSR strategy 2017 to 2020 included five pillars, one of which was human rights and ethical sourcing. And we're currently developing our next strategy to 2025, which will include again, a pillar on human rights and ethical sourcing. So this focus that we have had in the past as part of our corporate social responsibility will very much continue into the future, um, but it is a cross-functional um, integrated part of how we do business. And we are constantly seeking to integrate that into all other parts and areas of our engagement. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Nicole. That's that's great. And it's also genuinely encouraging to hear that, um, you know, to use Maya Angelou's words, uh, that, that once you know better, you need to do better. That that constant improvement, that continuous improvement referenced in, in uh, the act um, actually playing out in, in organisations like Conica Minolta. I guess just to, to wrap uh, these um, introductions up uh, from my past, present and future perspective, 
we do seem to be starting off from a quite a low base, as, as uh, Nicole Thompson was saying, with quite a generally low level of knowledge, not just about what modern slavery means, but where modern slavery and human rights abuses might be occurring through organizations, operations, and their supply chains. Despite the best efforts of organizations like the Supply Chain Sustainability School, Anti-Slavery Australia, Be Slavery Free, and, and initiatives like the, the calculator that, that Justin mentioned. And that, of course, is what makes it harder to assess and address the risks of harm to people. Um, there are a, a number of great initiatives. Um, Nicole Thompson mentioned that the Property Council of Australia's supplier platform, which has been going for just over a year now, um, and is seeking to look at much more of an educational collaborative approach to assessing and improving supply chain data. So trying to encourage continuous improvement throughout the supply chain and, and leading people to, I guess, current and relevant and accessible free resources. Um, and the future, the future is um, particularly hard to map at the moment, but I think, you know, as Justin said, the increasing use of uh, technology, of platforms, of systems, it is not just going to improve transparency. It's going to help us evaluate the risks and, and look at them um, to see where collaboration can achieve so much more than just working alone. And so which areas, which risk areas will need a sector wide approach or industry specific resources. And I think uh, with that increased supply chain visibility comes the knowledge that our our supply chains and those of the you know the, the panelists and all the attendees they're all interdependent and intertwined um, and so they're very much dependent on each other's success but what i'd like to do now is go from speaker to speaker and just tease out some of the issues around modern slavery risks draw on what we've said so far and understand a bit more about the, their different approaches um, I, I may start um susan and and nicole de souza i may start really with a, a, I guess, a foundational question. You're, you're with two quite different organizations, but are you seeing the language of human rights being used more in everyday corporate practice? Is the, is the topic becoming, I won't say normalized, but at least demystified to help you with those priorities? Um, Nicole, I might throw to you first. Sure. Um, thanks, Robin. I think it's a really important issue. And it's the reason I planted that phrase human rights due diligence in my um, introductory um, section. I've kind of made it my mission now to demystify that term as much as I possibly can, because I really believe it's at the heart of what we're being asked to do um, as organisations responding to modern slavery risk. It's about applying a human rights lens to the way that, that organisations conduct their operations and their business. And that, that language does need to be demystified. Um, you know, I was very enthusiastic two years ago when I first came to Konica Minolta about educating everybody about the Universal Declaration and the International Bill of Rights and using terminology that you could see the shutters come down on people's eyes. And actually, it's not about that necessarily. Um, I think it's more about unpacking what the real world implications of those things are and how they are relevant to each person in their role and what their capacity for influence and action to create a better world is. Um, and actually, that's a really empowering thing. Once we realise that, um, every procurement person is a potential human rights hero. Wow. You know? Um, and so for me, it's actually about that. It's actually about connecting the dots between um, what's being asked at the global level of us through the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which creates effectively an obligation for all businesses um, to respect human rights in their operations and supply chains. Um, but what does that mean for every business in practice from a small business through to a multinational? Um, and that's where the policies and practices and processes and um, the understanding the why, connecting people with um, with these new policies and processes so that it doesn't just become dry regulatory ticker box stuff, but actually we can say we are aligning ourselves with international human rights by adding this new tick box to our supply form because we now know something we didn't know before. And that's, I think, where the, where the demystification can happen. Thanks. We'll, we'll come back to the why later, because I think that's, you know, as Justin was saying, that's one of the most important elements. Susan, uh, tell us a bit more. Is, is, are you seeing the language of human rights being used a bit more? Are you seeing that unfolding in your, in your work? Well, the first thing I'd say is that um, as a sustainability manager, it, it's an evolving discipline. And, and so um, increasingly you see uh, different term pieces of terminology, different terminology, different tools, um, different approaches um, being 
um, introduced. And I think that Australia uh, in many ways is a few steps behind globally in relation to all the sustainability issues as a whole. Um, and I think in relation to human rights in particular, this is the case. I couldn't agree more with Nicole's comment that human rights needs to be demystified. But I think it's a, I don't know, I'd be interested in Justin's perspective on this, but I think it's a particularly challenging issue in the Australian context. I've worked in Europe and I've worked in the US and I don't see the language of human rights being something that people cringe about in the same way as they do here. Um, so from um, a materiality perspective, we annually uh, survey our key stakeholders, um, whether it be our workforce, our customers, um, management board, et cetera, um, suppliers and uh, ask them what they think are the most important issues for Australia Post to be addressing each year. year. Um, we've been following a similar approach for five years, but whenever we put the language human rights in there, no one ever thinks it's an issue. Like it never comes up as one of the priority issues that we should be addressing as a company. And all of that with the backdrop that Australia Post was Australia's first equal opportunity employer. In 1988, we had an Indigenous employment strategy years before the concept of a reconciliation action plan was invented. Um, we have had a, a gender pay parity for four consecutive years. We have very strong workplace employment practices. Now, all of those things are different human rights uh, matters, touch on different human rights matters. And when we, when we survey through materiality around those topics, they're all deemed to be very high. Safety, of course, is our number one priority, right, because we have people on the roads every day. And so, um, so I personally, in my current role, do not see the term human rights being used more and more. Um, but if I, in my role, in my organisation, but if I look at um, the discipline of sustainability and the, and the tools and, and the uh, conversations that are happening, particularly abroad, yes, it, it is it is an area um, that's increasingly being discussed, but I think there's a long way for, for businesses to go to have a greater level of comfort talking about human rights. Thank you. I might take your words and paraphrase slightly. Uh, Justin, are you seeing, I won't say the cultural cringe, but are you seeing that cringe factor around human rights? Are you seeing a, a sort of a, a hesitation in Australia? No, because those people wouldn't talk to me. I mean, if you're by the time you get to to our company, you're not cringing about that. Um, and the same thing goes here in the states and and elsewhere. I mean, we we've got customers in Europe and Canada and and here in the states. Everyone has, you know, for instance, in Canada, they don't want to use human trafficking. They want to use uh, I might get it wrong. They they the states that likes human trafficking and doesn't like modern slavery for obvious reasons. Um, Everyone's got their own kind of trigger words around this issue. I, to me, they all, child labor, worst forms of child labor, ILO, all the rest of it. It's like, yeah, people are being exploited. We can put that all in a bucket and try to fix that. So what are your, what are your clients asking you about prioritizing risks? What, what, are they, uh, what, what are the main things that people are coming to you concerned about at the moment? Well, I can tell you the clients that, that don't spend a lot of time with us, meaning don't don't jump on our platforms, are more the kind of tick box compliance driven. Let's just let's just file it on a folder and put it over here. No judgment, but what a, what a wasted opportunity I think to be a part of something so important. And and I say that both as a CEO and as a movement builder. I I, I really we run our company like a movement. We have a movement mentality. We give away parts of our income in order to help fund programs, and so. We're in it, you know, it's, it's, it's all the feels and all the dollars all at the same time. But so, again, our, our view and the, the, the people who do get close to us, um, the companies that are working with us really care. Like to the point where we get a little embarrassed that we're not doing enough as a technology to dig into the problems. Because technology, you know, does have its limitations and we, we get up every day trying to figure out how to, how to give the tools to our customers to make more of an impact. And I hear the word impact far more than I hear the word compliance with our customers. Mm -hmm. 
If I can just jump back in there, I don't think, I just want to be clear that I don't think it's so much that um, Australia Post doesn't care. Um, it's more the language or the terminology of human rights that I don't feel um, is, is, is necessarily useful in our organisation and helps with getting traction. Uh, but certainly, yes, we, you know, the, the proof points that I spoke to um, illustrate that it is uh, an area of importance to the company. And Susan, I think that's replicated across different sectors and different organisations, whether they're, you know, government or non-government, uh, depending on size or sector, that the language and as Justin was saying, the um, particular use of, you know, leaning towards some terms or away from others, you'll see that across sectors. And I am um, Nicole. Yeah. Just yeah, I think it's a really interesting discussion. And just um, to share some insights, we also, like Susan, um, have recently been on a materiality assessment journey, and um, it's interesting because Konica Minolta is an organisation that's very vocal about our commitment to and respect for human rights. And that has been reflected incredibly strongly in um, the assessment of our stakeholders. So internally, our employees recognise the significance and continue to um, indicate that it is important for Konica Minolta to take action on human rights and, and um, advocacy and, and ethical sourcing and modern slavery. Um, and externally, um, the small sample size, admittedly, of our external stakeholders that we um, engaged with in the, as part of our materiality assessment um, also provided a similar um, high prioritization in that area. So, um, and we have also recently conducted a kind of analysis of our um, major bids and tenders and, and customers. And um, there's an there has been a very significant increase in the sorts of questions that are coming. Um, and we knew that anecdotally, but we now have that internal evidence to, to demonstrate that customers, government and major enterprise are asking much more incisive questions. And the types of questions they're asking align to international human rights and labor organization standards. Um, so there is a very clear correlation um, between international human rights and where this sector is going. And if we look at what's happening in Europe with the development of potential mandatory human rights due diligence legislation, that is a major, major shift. And what that means is international businesses that operate in Australia will be changing their policies and programs and practices to align with legislation in other parts of the globe where they operate, which will have a cascading influence on their operations in Australia. So I think it's we should see the tide coming. I hope so. I really, I really hope so. I um, always remain optimistic, Robin. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, I may come back to you when I need a bit more optimism one day. Um, Nicole Thompson, tell us what you're seeing, I guess, about how your clients are, are asking you about prioritizing risk, but also, you know, this cascade that, that Nicole D'Souza was mentioning. Are you, are you seeing this as well across different sectors? Yeah, there's definitely, um, I think that we've definitely got clients feeling the, I guess, pressure as well. A lot of the, those clients that we're seeing, if you put them in the the leading kind of bucket as opposed to the, the tick box exercise. I think they're really feeling it isn't from the legislation, but more so from, say, investors or advocacy groups, um, or they've got someone dedicated, such as Susan or Nicole or Justin within their organisation who understands that this is an important issue and they're, they're advocating for that internally. Um, yeah, I think what we're hearing in terms of prioritization from clients, it's it's really overwhelming. And as everyone's touched on, there's all these competing priorities. And so it's not that it's not important to them. It's just that how do we how do we find our way and how do we, you know, pick which category or which supplier to focus on? And so um I think this is where that kind of hotspot analysis and supply chain understanding really comes from is to work on, you know, where can we have the most the most influence or or I guess impact. Um, yeah, and really going through each category of supplier and, and picking either um, yeah, environmental or social priorities and then communicating that throughout your supply and procurement teams and like Nicole said you know everybody has this role everybody can be a hero in human rights it's really just educating um, and empowering them to do so yeah thank you I might just um turn back Nicole D'Souza something you said earlier I, I 
I think there's a lot of focus uh, in, in the Modern Slavery Act on sort of the first few criteria around, um, you know, uh, essentially what are your risks and what are you doing about them? I think there's been a little bit of a gap uh, around how do you assess the effectiveness of what you're doing? Do you have any words of wisdom? So tell us a little bit about your approach, but how can organizations assess the effectiveness of what they're doing? Yeah, look, I think um, from my perspective, that's definitely the most challenging aspect of the legislation um, because what we're being asked to do is address a really complex global problem that so far governments um, and the civil society sector have been working for decades on it haven't been able to um, resolve to finality. So business is now another player as part of that. Um, so I think it's really important to recognise the long game and recognise that there is long-term commitment um, and resource allocation um, and a shifted time lens that you apply to um, to taking action and, and addressing, you know, addressing this issue. So um, how are we doing that at Conoco Minolta? You can read about it in detail in our modern slavery statement, but a kind of a, short, a few a few um, tips. We've established a modern slavery working group, a cross-functional working group across our organisation, um, and that is to hold um, our, our program to account, um, to bring um, to bring all parts of our business um, really squarely into the frame um, and to drive that implementation and embeddedness within our organisation, um, and and to sort of be a um, an opportunity for continuous improvement with a key group of um, core internal stakeholders. So that's one, one area. The other area is, as I've mentioned, we're a B2B. Um, and that means that our customers are coming to us as a supplier um, with their own reporting obligations. So where our customers are, um, you know, business entities that have a consolidated revenue of more than 100 million Australian dollars per year, then they have their own mandatory reporting obligations as well. And so, as I said, we are seeing um, a, a real upswing in the level of detail coming through in some of those questions. Uh, and, and we use those as learning opportunities. They're not just a compliance obligation for us. They are, that's an opportunity for introspection and reflection and referral to the Modern Slavery Working Group. Um, the other area is that we have um, recently worked on a project to develop a um, reporting framework, um, which I hope will be um, a baseline for future years reporting. Um, and we developed that um, with uh, international human rights standards and best practice from the sector, looking at um, human rights benchmarking and labour organisation benchmarking and, and multi-stakeholder initiatives and trying to distill that into a meaningful um, one and two step framework that we could apply for our own operations using the data available to us. Um, and the idea is to create a, a baseline so that in years to come, we will be able to track some form of improvement, um, even if it's against one or two um, data points. So I think there's, I think there's a number of levels at which you have to assess effectiveness. The first one is why are you doing this, and how do your actions reflect or contribute to why you're doing what you're doing. And I think that's absolutely at the core of absolutely everything. We're not doing this simply to be able to have something to report. We're moving this to hopefully shift the dial. And that might be engaging in webinars like this, where we are hopefully influencing other businesses to think differently or take action. And that selfishly contributes to better engagement across the business world, because all businesses are then moving, all ships are moving in the same direction. You mentioned um, you've got the, the Modern Slavery Working Group up and running, and actually that seems to be a common um, theme amongst some of the leaders. Uh, they're, they're providing a sort of a, a cross-disciplinary, multi-team working group. And as you said, they're looking for opportunities for continuous improvement. It's not a complaints process. It's it's positive. But you mentioned shifting the time frame and playing a, a longer game. What what are you five years, 10 years? What what are you looking at there, roughly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, our our next CSR strategy, as I said, will be a five-year strategy. Um, so that's certainly um a, a time frame. But um, you know, I mean, I, I for Conica Minolta as an organization, I think when you get to the five and ten year point, it's really beyond just Conica Minolta. What we're talking about is once we get beyond tier one, tier two, tier three of our supply chain and and you know, we're, we're operating at that level, you've got to be looking then at collaborative action. You've got to be looking at, you know, how is um, business feeding back to government, feeding back into legislative processes, or, you know, we've got a three-year review period for the modern slavery legislation, for example. Um, it's then, you know, effectiveness of your actions might be advocacy to address the problems that you haven't been able to, to uh, address 
by directly engaging with your supply chain or once you've identified those risk areas and you have limited capacity for influence, what is going to shift the dial? So I think, you know, effectiveness of, of actions really comes back to what are you trying to achieve and what is it that needs to change? And what we're trying to achieve and what we need to change will change depending on the time frame that you apply. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I might just building on that, um, Susan, uh, I say this without trying to be ingratiating, but Australia Post is is, is recognised in procurement circles as, as being leaders around, you know, social procurement, social uh, value around Indigenous procurement. How, I mean, that is, that is a, again, a long-term game, as, as Nicole was just saying, mm-hmm. but how has this come about how have you managed to achieve that change but also how has that helped advance your work around modern slavery and human rights Mm, sure so australia post being um, a community oriented organization um, means that some sort of some sort of initiatives that sometimes might be challenging or uh, obscure to other businesses just is automatic for post. Um, And I think the area of social and Indigenous procurement is one of those. So we, you know, have a presence in every community around Australia. We're often often the the heart of those, you know, particularly remote and regional communities. Um, And so... um, and also our our product is required. We're required to um, perform a product... Uh, at a, a uniform rate to ensure, to ensure inclusivity so that no one is left behind. So this concept of I- inclusion and fairness is, is sort of a core to our purpose as well in a very, you know, deep way, not in sort of like spin that we have on our website. And it, it drives the, the thinking and the culture of the organisation. And so um, so some years ago when, the, when you know, Supply Nation was established and, and some of these other entities, um, social traders obviously, um, it was really quite uh, uh, logical for us to start looking at our procurement practices and seeing how we can purchase in a way that has positive benefits for Indigenous businesses, for Australian disability enterprises and for other social enterprises. And we've gone about, um, for the first few years, I, I think it was a capacity building thing and, and, and getting procurement teams to understand that um, there was opportunity to focus beyond delivering on time and at a cost and, and that to that they had the power and, and opportunity to create additional forms of value through their everyday practices. Um, and so we were able to um, work with the procurement team over years uh, around that and actually I think also some of this work I really strongly feel comes down to just having great people. And we've had a couple of really great people in our team um, that have uh, somebody, as, as you know, um, Robin Steph Roach, um, for example, um, was in the procurement team as a young as a young procurement personnel. And then she moved across into sustainability because of this issue and was so passionate. So that experience working with the procurement team on issues that would be on delivering on time and a certain cost um, and getting them to think about social issues has created bridges with that team and created a a conversation that I think um, we've been able to build on and and leverage further with respect to modern slavery. Um, Also, I worked with that team about three years ago on setting up a set of sustainable procurement principles, and one of them was to prioritise purchasing from social um, Indigenous and ethically certified organisations. And the other one was to not use exploitative um, uh, or forced labour practices and to ensure that we had um, exploit, um, you know, fair wages as well. So those um, those sets of principles, I think, um, were used to uh, support training and, and, and you know, was the focus point of training, I guess, with with the procurement team as well over many years, and that we've been able to build on that further with with the conversation around modern slavery. Thank you, um, Justin. I'm going to turn to you. Gloves off. Since we're talking about procurement, uh, you know the the um, Deloitte's um, survey, which they they did of you know global chief procurement officers. I, I think before the Modern Slavery Act came out reported that 65% of global procurement leaders uh, said that they had limited or no visibility beyond their tier one or their their immediate suppliers. If that's the case, how can reporting entities, how can big organisations around Australia actually even know, let alone manage their risks properly? 
But it's true. I think it's. I think it's. I think that is really about first tier. I, I think very, very few companies. I would. I would argue it's closer to the single digit percentages have an understanding beyond tier one. Those are usually apparel or or uh, CPG. So um, it, it is very difficult to understand where risk uh, risk beyond tier one. And in fact, that's most likely where risk is happening. But you you have to take baby steps and. Uh, sometimes we forget that we forget to celebrate the pretty good and while we're waiting to celebrate the perfect, which never comes. Um, and so part of this is building, you know, building a process over time. And so, you know, the way that we approach it is and the way that we celebrate with our customers is, it's really important to understand your first tier suppliers and understand uh, that you are a company based not just of value, but of values. And those showing up through the procurement process um, quite frankly, has a, is going to mean a whole lot more. Um, not just because you got an, uh, a, you know, an SAQ from a company that matters, but also that it comes up during a, a, a sourcing event and understanding and getting better, understanding where your first tier suppliers are. But, but really, what you want to be understanding is what your first tier suppliers are doing, what their first tier suppliers are doing, right? Getting an, an understanding of that. And that is really mattering here in the US. In fact, just this week, for the first time ever, uh, Customs and Border Patrol actually got a conviction on a company that was importing sweetener um, here to the U.S. And it, it, in a lot of ways, it's a shot across the bow around a 1930 tariff act that banned the importation of slave-made goods. Back in the 30s, there was a, it allowed for unless we could make it here in America. So basically, you could make whatever you want with slavery in America if you couldn't be made somewhere else. But Obama closed that off. And then in this administration, they've been enforcing it. And this is coming down to uh, you know, sanctioning suppliers and, and cotton suppliers in China, northern China, elsewhere. But those are usually second or third tier um, suppliers. And that's very, companies are kind of found flat footed, understandably so, when you've never been asked to do that before. That's not a job as a procurement person or sustainability person you've been asked to do. So the only real way to get that, especially in a time of COVID where there are no auditors showing up at factories, is using big data and analysis. And I keep hearing about action and impact, but you, there really is a, a, a gestation of being able to get insights, take action, and then you see impact. And those don't all come at once. And usually they come in very short bursts with an SAQ or, uh, or getting a better understanding of the data that goes into your supplier network. So it's really important to understand that this is something that grows over time. It's not going to happen in one reporting period. And that's why there's multiple reporting periods for this issue, because the government understands, just to, 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 to what I understand, that it, this is something that's going to have to get better over time. So companies getting into their second and third year reporting are going to need to start thinking about how do we get better visibility and understand what risk looks like and what impact looks like as they go forward. So uh, we've heard, uh, you know, from Susan and yourself uh, about the importance of having a great team and about about the people. Um, and I saw uh, David had just repeated that that you know great quote: "You're not just a company of value, but values." Um, thanks, David. It's it's great to have that clarified again. But but Justin, what is the role of big data? Um, you know, big data and predictive analysis and and the technology. You, you've mentioned it, but how are we going to genuinely use it to to take these big leaps forward? Uh, big data means nothing without analysis. You have to have a way to be able to crunch and synthesize big data. The good news is there's enough big data out there where you can start to understand risk beyond tier one. That's very possible. You can, there's, there's ways, um, we're starting to do this for some of our customers where we're getting them insights. We call them trading partners where we can help our customers just by telling us their suppliers, we have ways in which we can help them understand their supplier suppliers. That's kind of cool because now you can, you know, what I heard when I first started going to supply chain conferences is, oh, you know, we've got all the responsibility, but none of the power. We can't see our whole supply chain. Well, it's better now. Yeah, I can't tell you where you, you know, where your cobalt comes from, but we could probably get to your second or third tier supplier. So big data means nothing without some type of analysis. And analysis leads to the insights, right? So what the insights are what gets shared to the wonderful people inside the company. And how do we want to act on this? What does this look like? What's our policy? Do we cut and run? Do we put them on probation? That's where it gets real. And that's where you start to see the impact. So big data comes first, but it's just a big bowl of spaghetti without some kind of spoon to start pointing out and, and giving something to eat with. 
Okay, so Nicole Thompson, we've heard about the role of big data, and I know I've heard this, but I'm sure you've got clients coming to you and saying, look, we've, we've, we've rolled out a supplier questionnaire, we've sent it to our high-risk suppliers, is that enough? Do we, do we need to do more than that? What, uh, where do we go from here? Yeah, supplier questionnaires would definitely find you kind of everybody's go-to in terms of due diligence, which makes sense. You know, it's what everybody's normally rolling out and using for your quality and safety and everything. Um, but I think, you know, a supplier questionnaire is really only as good as the procurement process in place or the people behind it to manage that. And as Justin just said, you know, you need that analysis behind it. So if you're not using tech and you're relying on your sourcing or project managers or procurement managers to roll out a supplier questionnaire, with that really needs to be, um, you know, a whole heap of other support. And so that's, you know, starting with upskilling and providing them with knowledge so that those managers have the confidence to be able to have those conversations with suppliers. So if someone's not performing on a supplier questionnaire, um, you know, they can go back and say, you know, hey, what's going on? I think as well, or around that, rather than just rolling out questions, you need to set what does a good response look like? So is there a methodology and is there an understanding of what's acceptable? So what's an organization's risk appetite? red flag so training up people to be able to say okay there's something not right here um, and know what questions to ask I think uh, as well so we hear time and time again you know resources no one has resources to do this there's another 20 questions that we need to ask our suppliers um, and so I think it's super important for if this is of real value, if human rights, modern slavery is of real value and importance to an organisation, hear that from the top down um, and just say, yes, you've got permission to spend time on this or budget or resources to do so. Spend the time on doing those due diligence and have those conversations with suppliers. Um, yeah, I think that's that. Supplier, you know, supplier questionnaires are all about creating that two-way conversation. It's not just that let's let's get them to check a box that they have policy. Um, you know, that's definitely part of it. But I think if you know, rolling out questionnaire, starting the conversation, asking where do you need support and where may we have those shared risks and we can, can work together. That's real the real purpose of a supplier questionnaire. Thank you. I think that two-way conversation is, is particularly important. It's not just a one-way flow of information and now what do we do with it? How do we analyze it? But how can we work with our suppliers and through our supply chains on improving things over time? Um, I, I should probably um, drop a last question in before we turn to the audience. I've seen there's a, a few questions already coming through, so uh, please get those through now. Um, I think it's important to maybe, I may ask Nicole D'Souza and Justin this, but the challenges that, that COVID-19 has thrown up uh, when it comes to modern slavery risks and organizational priorities, because I think now, I won't say more than ever, but now it is particularly hard to keep social issues at the forefront of conversations when, when you know, uh, with an economic downturn arriving. Uh, what are the challenges and how do we how do we overcome these? And Nicole, I might go to you first. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Robin. Um, look, it's a it's been, I think, the number one human rights issue for businesses to address this year, you know. Um, and so there's that there's that human rights um, approach, which is to, cons to be concerned about the welfare of people in your business and your supply chains um, and introducing that, as Susan was saying before, as a additional uh, consideration addition, in addition to you know, price and quality um, and speed of delivery, as was often the case in um, in the COVID environment, um, which, which is to say that you need to reinforce the importance of human rights or social sustainability, whatever language you're using. Um, now is not the time for us to be dropping the ball on our focus and commitment to human rights. If anything, it's more important than ever. Um, and I think when you apply the modern slavery in the time of COVID um, lens, we all now know there's very, very clear evidence of um, you know, high levels of modern slavery risk um, associated with the production of 
personal protective equipment, which every organisation is, is sourcing um, to protect their employees and, and some sectors more so than others. Um, so what does that mean in practice? Um, it means informing yourself, informing your organisation and and recognising that risk is a constantly shifting metric um, and that we need to have sources of information that provide that intelligence. Um, so Konica Minolta works with Freedom, for example, and we have, you know, real-time media alerts of, um, of risk. Uh, we have access through the UN Global Compact Network Australia that we're a member of. We participate in their modern slavery community of practice. Um, we have, you know, globally um, recognised sources of information, access to webinars, expert guidance that we can quickly um, draw from and distill, and then look to integrate into our um, into our supply chain. So, um, you know, going back to the kind of broader commitments to human rights, another area that Konica Minolta is committed to is Indigenous procurement, um, and we we aim to launch our first reconciliation action plan um, very soon. But uh, we're also a member of Supply Nation. So in the short term, we were able to, working with our procurement teams, um, to redirect spend towards Indigenous businesses for the, for the sourcing of our um, personal protective equipment. Um, and that's something that is an ongoing, I think, piece of engagement with suppliers to understand where that's, where that's um, what their level of um, visibility is um, in that area. Thanks for that. Justin, um... How can how can organisations try and keep social issues at the front of at the forefront of conversations, especially during a, a pandemic? Because uh, it's getting worse, and about twenty years of gains around reducing child labour have been lost in six months. Uh, poverty, um, slavery is essentially poverty with the bottom dropped out of it, right? And so we're seeing, and we're going to continue to see increased extreme poverty, which it creates, you know, extreme vulnerability. Um, this is going to affect every business in the world. And just like businesses are learning to retool their sales and retool their supply chains and retool their marketing, we have to retool our oversight. Um, I, I just, I believe that in times of survival, I, that I believe that innovation is just survival with a cooler name. Uh, it's something, it's a way in which you learn how to do something you have to do and do it better. And I don't prescribe to um, I don't prescribe to the idea that that you know addressing forced labor and supply chains is a nice to have or uh, a should do. I just don't think it's I just don't think it's I just think it's much bigger than that. And I believe that because we're how many months into COVID and we're still talking about it and there's still more and more issues around this. It's not going away because of the pandemic. So what um, does retool our oversight mean? Uh, you already talked about it using big data. Use, not relying as or, or, or empowering audits to do far more than just ch check boxes. We've got to do a lot more and, and think a lot, uh, 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 use the tools at hand, the same tools that we use to be able to find customers and to serve customers, we need to find and use to be able to um, serve people in our supply chains. And those tools are available. It's just one of the spaces, it's a um, oversight and supply chains is a cost center. So it's not going to get all the cool toys as quick as anything else. It's just, that's just the way it is. That's all right. But that just means you just got to do it smarter and better. And so that's that's part of what we try to do. But there's there's lots of ways in which you can do it. You just have to, the, but the beginning is you have to be willing to think different about how you do these things. We had a question earlier on, Justin, just to, to close this one off. Um, how do you recommend that we approach suppliers um, to, to assist them in building an ethical workforce? Any any suggestions there? Yeah, come, come as a helper. So come with information about how to help them. Do not come as a buyer with a waving finger. Come as a, did you know, how about this? Have you tried this? Can you, don't just take a questionnaire, look for ways in which the gaps that they're missing and ways that you can help them. I just think it's this top-down approach isn't gonna, isn't gonna work. Only a network is gonna be built upon people about, around companies working together. And there's a great, one of the, the um, if I can say this, uh, when I ran a nonprofit, one of our primary funders was Pierre Amidiar, who started eBay. And we had a few rare opportunities. I, want, I don't want to, we didn't spend a lot of time with him, but we'd ever get, ever so often we go to cocktail parties. And I remember him sharing one time, he said, when we started eBay, what, 98 or 99? I don't know what that was. He's like, people were so afraid of the internet. But we just had this belief, much less do commerce on the internet. But the people at eBay had this belief that people are basically good. And they just need opportunities to demonstrate their trust to each other. And that's what that built. We wouldn't have an Uber or an Airbnb without an eBay, right? 
And I actually believe supply chains are the same way. People are basically good. They just need a network in which they can demonstrate their trust with one another. And that's how we have to think about it. That's a really good point. Thank you for that. We've got a number of questions rolling in. So I may just move on. Uh, we may sort of ask for, for briefer answers. Um, actually, Nicole, there's a, a question here, um, uh, essentially about how we move from checking boxes from a compliance approach to actionable and realistic topics. At, uh, if surveys and assessments aren't necessarily, um, you know, giving a fair view, how do we how do we move from that checkbox approach onwards? Uh, Nicole Thompson, sorry, I was uh, should have uh, directed that one a bit better. <laughs> sorry, um, yeah, it's really about that. That comes back to the values. How do we make human rights you know, core to business and comes back to that same um, language about how how do we make this important. So a materiality assessment, ask, ask your stakeholders, for example, as Nicole D'Souza has done, um, this people, it's easier to sell, I guess, than sustainability and environmental issues because we're talking about real people in our supply chains here. And so as soon as you start to have conversations internally, as well as externally um, and make that connection to people, I think the importance of this starts to, to rise up. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Nicole de Souza and Susan, there's a question here, which I think goes back to our earlier conversation. Um, the discussion about the language we use and what triggers people in different cultures makes me wonder how we work on our biases about slavery and human rights, like we do for gender and race bias. Any good examples? Of this, any good example of um, you know these these biases and how we how we uh, improve these over time? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think if you were to adopt a human rights based approach, as we try and do at Conica Minolta, you need to be looking at um, human beings as um, empowered individuals that are capable of self determination, um, and so recognizing, for example, that um, much of slavery intersects with migrant workers and labor exploitation. Um, so, you know, you look at the flows of people that, that um, I'm, I'm meant to be giving a short answer, so I'm going to stop now. But I think, um, you know, if you take that human rights based approach, you realize that there are multiple um, drivers that lead a person to seek employment, to seek uh, opportunity, to seek livelihood, to seek happiness. Um, and equally so, there are drivers and um, geopolitical factors that overlay gender. So I think it's 71% of um, people who are enslaved are women and girls. Um, so there's a very, very strong gender bias uh, against women in, in enslavement. And, and race Susan. is a huge factor, I think, with Australia's history, um, the history of Indigenous um, enslavement um, and un unpaid wages in Australia is, is part of that, that history as well. Thank I'm you. sure that Justin could share a lot on that on that particular point coming from the US. But um, but one of the issues that I see, um, one of the comments that I see that that grates with me, I have to say, is is the is the viewpoint that well, if if children are, are not working, then the family is not getting food, and and I I I think it's really important to draw the distinction between. Um, you know, child child work and child labour or child exploitation. Um, you know, children can go to work and and uh, children can go to school and also be able to support their family um, with uh, you know providing um, a, a supplementary income and food on the table. Um, but it, it it really disturbs me when when colleagues, um, not necessarily at Australian Post, but over time, have sort of made the point. Well, you know. The, there's poor countries in Asia or poor countries in Africa, the children need to work. Actually, the children need to have the opportunity to be educated so that they can be um, moved beyond this cycle of poverty and inequality and injustice. And, and I think that, that that's a bias that needs to be uh, stamped out. Thank you. There's well a really good question here, which, uh, again, I, I find personally important, but um, I guess Justin and Nicole Thompson, What's the most impactful way we can engage our staff when rolling out training around modern slavery, uh, especially around human trafficking? Uh, some people may feel so removed from this uh, or not see the direct relevance of this to day-to-day -to -day roles. Any, any good suggestions around impact and training? Justin, let's go to you first. Yeah, I think it's um, w w oftentimes when I tell um, people who our customers are, they'll go, oh, wait, that's a, that's a services industry. They don't have a supply chain. 
Um, and I think that if you come at it through the lens of um, the, where does a come at it through the lens of responsibility and talk to, you know, in terms of training, in terms of talking to, to, to folks inside the company, start with the question of what is our responsibility as a company to not just ourselves, but to those we do business with? And where does that responsibility end? Of course, it's it, it can't be endless, but I think it's a it, it, it is an opening statement or opening question to say, does our responsibility just end with our own employees? Does it end with our customers? Does it actually involve our, our supply chain? Okay, great. If it involves our supply chain, how are we making sure that our values are being protected? Do we, do we want those values to be protected just with our suppliers? Or are we receiving benefit as a company, whether through indirect or direct spend beyond just those and I think those are concepts that it's okay to not understand out of the gate. Most people don't, but increasingly more are. And having an understanding to not just see responsibility as a burden, but as an opportunity for a company to be able to express its values. Because the great thing about using procurement to change the world is you were going to spend that money anyway. And Nicole Thompson, uh, any any pointers around training, and in particular, just to link to another question, empowering people in the training, so empowering them to address the situation, not just improve levels of knowledge. Yeah, it's it's exactly that. The mix of giving responsibility, just touched on before, is if the if you've got procurement managers, project managers, sourcing managers who are responsible for this now empowering them, seeing that this is a company value, but it can be your value as well. And and I guess giving them that chance to see that they can have an impact through their work. Every role in an organisation, whether it's HR or legal or recruitment or whatever, has some role to play in terms of mitigating modern slavery because it's the organisation as a whole and the way that they do business, which is impacting the supply chain. So. In terms of you know training, practically what can you do? We see the comment coming through that yes, you know we've done a thirty-minute webinar or something like that, and I think that's in terms of due diligence actions. A lot of companies are doing that little tick box. Yeah, we've done a presentation on when slavery will change our employees. Look at training for what does each team mean. So legal will need something different from um, sourcing, just like HR will, et cetera. So make sure the training is tailored for that audience. Maybe you want to start with you know, a wide, broader, what is bond slavery, but then drill it down into what does this mean for your role personally um, and what are the actions you can take in your business and responsibilities. Um, so it's definitely long game, like anything. Start with training, drill down to specific modules without there's so many resources out there. Um, and I think that those working groups as well are really important as part of training to understand where are the gaps and continue, continue to fill them. I, I may add to that, having been involved in a number of, of these sort of training modules and, and uh, resources, but the three questions you really want to set out with are, what do you want people to know? Be really clear. What do you want people to do? And that could be about empowering them or, or taking action if they see something. But what do you want people to change? And that goes back to the procurement issues or the organizational culture. What do you want them to change over time? And yes, that can be a long game, but it's really important to be clear about how and what you want them to change. There's a question here which um, as, uh, it says maybe a bit left of field, but is actually really uh, interesting about whether the increased legislation and scrutiny on supply chains may see companies de-risking by re-onshoring work or, or uh, buying more things locally. So bringing things back to within, I won't say within Australia because we have an international audience, but within the country. Um, do you think this will have impacts further down the supply chains in, say, developing countries? Um, Justin, any any thoughts on this one about re-onshoring and, and about uh, moving risks around? Sounds great in an election year. I mean, I think that's... I think that ship has sailed. Uh, I just don't. I just don't see it. Let me be clear. I've never owned a supply chain, and I think it's. I think it's ambitious. I don't think modern slavery acts are enough for, for to do that. I think obviously there's going to be other factors, and I think 
you know, look, I sometimes trade wars are a great way to be able to get um, to get human rights work done. Um, I don't care. I'll, we'll jump on top of that and try to get, uh, you know, we've there was a uh, uh, here in the U.S. between us and, 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 and Mexico and Canada, there was a the, the NAFTA trade agreement has been has been reprovisioned, recreated, renamed new acronym. We all have to learn and and added inside of it is the banning of importation of slave made goods. So that's not a modern slavery act. That's a, it's a trade enforcement act, and it's being taken very seriously, very seriously. So I I, I don't I don't know about how I think we can do more <laughs> by using what we've got and using our dollars being spread around the world um, to be able to to make change around that. And, and to me, that's that's probably the best plan that we could execute against. There's a question here which I may answer directly. Where can we get practical information to identify hotspots? Uh, and is the Property Council database launched and available for use by others? Uh, I think there's a lot of great information out there. And yes, you can go to different websites, the social hotspots databases. Uh, you know, there are teams with whom you can work, uh, people like Freedom, that look at um, particular risks in a lot more depth. The, the Property Council supplier platform is uh, available. It's, it was launched uh, in October last year, and it's gone through the pilot phase. Uh, you can download the uh, question set, so you can have a look at the assessment questions. Um, it was always designed to be something that was transparent and something that would evolve with the legislation. And so, you know, the questions will change. The free resources uh, and learning modules that are linked from it will also change in time. Um, and I'll provide a link uh, in the chat box and in the follow-up email that we sent around, we send around um, after this event. There is a cracker of a question here, um, Nicole D'Souza and uh, Susan. I'm going to bowl this your way um, because I think it's much more sort of organizational. But um, do we need to acknowledge that in many cases we will need to pay more and wait longer for slavery-free products and services? And if so, how do we make this case with our stakeholders, Nicole? Are we going to need to pay more and wait longer, or is this just the um, uh, the cost of our social license to operate? Yeah, look, I, I think um, you have to reverse the question in the words of our managing director and ask yourself, um, who's paying the cost? Um, you may not be paying the cost, but somebody's paying it with their life. And once you know that, you, you don't ask that question. And so it really comes back to the why we're on this journey and um, and if you do have genuine organisational commitment, and it's so important to bring everyone from top to bottom of your organisation um, on that journey and use whatever driver you need to. We've got legislation in Australia. Some people will respond, some boards, some organisations will respond to the compliance angle. And, and so the compliance angle is not one to be, um, it, you know, diminished. I think it's a very important sword. Um, and and if, that's the, if that's what gets you across the line, well, this is no longer socially acceptable. It's, it's contrary to the social licence to operate well and good. Um, and, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we, we do have that commitment to be able to pay more if we need to. So um, I think, yes, possibly. I, I don't think it's necessarily a black and white answer. Um, re let's recognise that at the heart of this, we're talking about crime. You know, we're talking about the worst forms of human rights violations when we talk about modern slavery. And there's a whole spectrum of conduct that, that comes before that in terms of labour exploitation. But really, is it acceptable to have crime in your supply chain and to be profiting off that? If you can answer that question in the affirmative, I think it's a really simple answer. Thank you. Um, Susan, I may um, ask, you know, uh, I think it's a really reasonable question. Do we need to acknowledge, is, acknowledge that we may need to pay more and wait longer? But what's maybe uh, your perspective on that? How do we, mm. how do we explain that, to communicate that with, with stakeholders? I think Nicole addressed that really beautifully and I totally agree with her. I, I don't necessarily think it's going to lead to in, increased um, increased costs for, on, on products. Um, and it's an argument that I, I think it's, it's an argument that just gets raised because sometimes people don't want to take that extra, extra step that will work differently. Um, and it's something that I hear raised a lot in relation to social Indigenous procurement as well. Like, oh, it's nice that we might purchase through them, but it's always going to cost us more. In fact, no, it doesn't necessarily cost us more. And for those companies to be viable, they need to compete in the marketplace as well, right? And so they're, they're not necessarily going to 
uh, be more expensive. It may require partnering differently and capacity building for a little while, uh, but I don't, I don't uh, accept the viewpoint that, um, that we have to wait longer and it's going to cost more. Um, there's another really good question here, uh, which Jenny has asked uh, both in, in the chat and Q&A. Um, uh, how can we ensure that people recognize what modern slavery looks like? Um, we've had, you know, a number of people talk about, you know, child work or the worst forms of child labor or what it may uh, look like in different countries. But how can we ensure people recognize what modern slavery looks like, whether it's construction or IT or cleaning or agriculture, not just in tier one? Um, and I guess, uh, you know, how can we canvas for a hotline for Australia? I'd certainly put my hand up to support that. Um, Justin, how can we help people recognize what it looks like? Well, if you, if, you, if you saw it up close, it would just look like poverty. That's the great, that's, I've taken folks on trips to meet kids in slavery and, and I've even you know, had the chance to take some, some famous people on trips to slavery and they kind of get angry because it just, they said, well, that's just poverty. And I'm like, well, what you're not seeing is this child um, is threatened with violence, they're economically exploited and they're unable to walk away. So if you fit under those three it, just a very simple, um, it might look like poverty or it might look like kids helping their parents or it might look like just another problem in the world, but there's a unique wrapper around that that if they fall under those, any one of those three, so that could be migrant workers um, working on a construction site in Dubai, that could be construction workers uh, or, 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 or strawberry growers here in the Central Valley in California. Um, if there's economic exploitation, they're unable to walk away, they're taking away of passports. It's not a very complex description. It just doesn't advertise itself as slavery. And I think that's the number one thing to understand is no one, and, and least, most of the people that I've met wouldn't, didn't even know the term slavery. No one would go, oh, by the way, you know, yeah. my name's Ebenezer and I'm in slavery. They wouldn't have seen that. They just see sleep their life sex. Yeah. Um, we are going to need to draw this webinar to a close. We've got five or six minutes left. Um, yes, uh, in answer to one of the questions, yes, the, the recording will be made available um, after, after the event. Um, and that link will be sent around and, uh, on places like the Supply Chain Sustainability School. Um, but as we wrap up, I'm going to go around each of the, the speakers for, I guess, one or two last pearls of wisdom. Um, I'm going to ask them to end with their maybe their top tips um, for... I guess, A, prioritizing risks in this space uh, and B, engaging both internally and externally around these issues. So prioritizing risks and engaging internally and externally. Um, Nicole D'Souza, I'll uh, turn to you first. Sure, thanks. Um, with prioritizing risk, I'd say um, spend is not your only criteria. Um, the work has come before you, so look to experts who've already put the work together, Some th people like the Global Slavery Index, um, Walk Free, um, the Commonwealth Government Guidance um, provides a whole range of resources that you can access. Um, make sure that you are assessing your suppliers by industry and you know, map your supply chain to the extent that you can at least say where in the world your goods are coming from um, so that you have at least a prim preliminary understanding of, um, of, um, of risk. Um, and in, in relation to the second question, which was internal and external collaboration, was that right? Um, choose value-aligned partners. Um, choose organisations that are heading in the same direction that you are and that will help support your vision and your mission. And seek, seek to partner with organisations that provide something complementary and different to what you can offer. So if you're from the business world, Think about your possibilities of working with civil society organisations, trade unions that relate to your sector, um, you. government organisations. Um, and, you know, for example, high risk area in Australia, cleaning accountability framework is an amazing multi-stakeholder initiative um, that brings together different sectors. Um, so look at Thank that. You. Value aligned, value aligned partners, I think is really important. Susan, uh, tell us a top tip or two. Uh, so my top tips would be to establish a cross-functional working group that's um, looking at what the risks are. I think in big complex organisations um, that need to report on, on, you know, with a turnover of more than 100 
million dollars and need to report against this legislation, it's really easy to see your part of the business from, from where you sit. But having a cross-functional group, I think, will uh, um, allow you to challenge one another and learn from one another and, it, and ensure that this approach to your approach to the uh, reporting is not a compliance exercise and, and retains the spirit of the legislation which is around continuous improvement and actually stamping out non slavery so that's the first one is the working group and the second one um, I would very much prepare yourself your colleagues your management and your board for the fact that you'll probably find something at some point Yep. Um, I think um, modern slavery is in all of our supply chains and, and even in some of our direct operations. And we may not find it this year. In fact, I can say hand on heart that, um, you know, for our first annual report, for our first modern slavery report that we're about to release for Australia Post, we haven't found any clear evidence of it in this past year. But I'm confident of the fact that at some point in time in the future it will arise. And, uh, and I think you need to prepare everybody for that fact. Thank you. Um, Nicole Thompson, tell us uh, a top tip or two as we close. I think top tip from prioritisation, you know, spend latent risk is definitely important, but as you figure out where to prioritise in the next year or so, find a few key suppliers that you know you can work with. And so in terms of top tip for external partnerships is really work with those suppliers and share your knowledge on risk. If you've done a risk assessment, share it with your suppliers. The more you can share knowledge, build a trusted relationship rather than a transactional one, um, you know, the more progress you make. So, yeah, share your knowledge, share your risk. Don't do it alone. Thank you. And, Justin, tell us a, a top tip or two on which to close. Yeah, you can't, um, you can't uh, manage what you can't measure. So don't try to manage something if you don't understand it. You need to analyze risk. You need to understand, get an understanding of where it's where it is so that you can start to manage risk in front of supply chains. So that would be the first one. Mm -hmm. And the second one is um, don't waste a crisis. You know, the, the world is, it's not just the pandemic. There's a lot going on, obviously, in me sitting in, in, in America. Um, uh, systemic injustice is something that I think we all think that in some level we would all jump up and stand up against Nazis and walk with King. Um, in some ways, cases, this is our opportunity to bring the whole of ourselves, which also includes our professional selves, into um, the arena of systemic injustice. And supply chains are systems that have injustice embedded into the commercial relationships. Yeah. And this is your opportunity and invitation to step inside of systemic injustice and start to create systems of justice. Thank you. That's no, that's really great words. I think as for me, I'll, I'll simply re reiterate that uh, partnership is the new leadership. We need to look at who we can work with and, and, you know, align with people with the same values. But also, you know, I'm be really clear about this. Human rights and modern slavery should be a non-compete space. This is one in which we are working with our staff and suppliers and subcontractors, and we are working, collaborating as much as we can to make sure that everyone follows that, uh, that continuous improvement line. Um, so as we close the webinar, uh, once again, many thanks to each of our speakers, Nicole Thompson from Edge Environment, Susan Mizrahi from Australia Post, Justin Dillon from Freedom, and Nicole D'Souza from Konica Minolta, Australia. Uh, and a big thank you to Edge Environment, of course, for providing the ticketing and recording capabilities. Uh, please, everyone, look out for the recording of this webinar on different websites. Uh, we Look forward to you joining future discussions. Um, my name is Robin Mellon. It's been a pleasure leading this conversation on prioritizing your modern slavery risks. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you for all the attendees. Stay safe, stay well, and thank you all.